we're going to have some spotlight presentations now, um, looking at those areas of working with local authorities, making connections in our place, praying into the challenges and bringing lived experience into future design. We're going to begin um, with that working with local authorities. Um, we've seen this as being really important with the movement for homelessness and housing, that we have almost the church, Christian charities and third sector, um, the local authority and business in a sort of four-way partnership uh, within any, any one of our places. That would be the ideal that we'd look to, to see whether we could bring about. Um, so we want to start with working with local authorities. I'm going to play you um, an interview that I had with uh, Molly Bishop, who is the strategic lead for homelessness in Greater Manchester first, and then I'm going to speak to Paul uh, Watson uh, from um, Wolverhampton about how he, he's experienced that um, from Enterprise Homes' point of view. Um, so let's, let's listen to, uh, to Molly as she gives her thoughts um, in relation to uh, how we get involved in partnerships with, uh, with local authorities. So Molly, it's great to, to have you with us. Perhaps you could just tell, let us know a little bit about your role and your background. Yes, yeah, so um, I work for the Greater Manchester Combined Authority, so for the Greater Manchester Mayor, Andy Burnham, um, and my remit is strategic uh, development and, and improvement across homelessness and rough sleeping for the city region. Um, I've worked for uh, housing associations and a number of, kind of social value organisations uh, prior to this role, um, and I started off in uh, working for the University of, of Bristol in a business startup for, for social value organisations. Well, it's great to have you with us. We're just thinking about what strategic contribution uh, the faith sector can make in relation to homelessness. What are your, your thoughts on that? Um, I think it's really significant. So um, there's a real kind of uh, movement towards uh, public services that are community led and community powered, that are place based, so rooted in neighbourhoods and, and communities and, and smaller areas within um, within society. Um, and also focused on kind of early help and, and prevention as well, instead of just kind of responding to a react uh, crisis. Um, and all of that work is, is, is relevant to homelessness, so both uh, preventing homelessness um, by supporting people to be able to kind of get the help that they need when they need it, um, but also relieving homelessness, so what happens if and, and, and when individuals and families become homeless and, and what kind of help and support can they access then. So um, I think for faith-based organisations and, and churches, there's a strategic role to play in describing their um, describing their role really in what uh, uh, unlocking community power through their communities looks like for the purposes of homelessness prevention and homelessness relief. Um, there's organisations such as uh, We Are Local um, that champion that unlocking community power and, and, and exploring what that means for different sectors and different kinds of organisations. In Greater Manchester we call it public service reform, um, but it's got a few different uh, different names in different places. So if, if a church or a Christian charity really wanted to get connected with their local authority, what's your best advice in relation to that as a first step? Yeah, I think in the first instance, um, it's, it's good to think about um, what what resources you have and, and how you want to use them. Um, I mean, the, the, the kind of most obvious things are the people within your congregation and the parish and um, their uh, ability to raise resource, give their time, give their skills and expertise. Um, in terms of actually engaging with the local authority, um, kind of simple way is always to approach your councillor, um, uh, and that could be the councillor that's got a lead, a portfolio lead uh, within the council for homelessness, um, or it could be just uh, the, the, the councillor that's local to your place. Um, I think it's always good to, yeah, to have some sort of offer uh, or uh, to, to be able to express 
what it is that you want to to do. Um, having said that, I think it's really important that that when any organisations kind of engage in homelessness work, that they're prepared to work in partnership and to learn from other organisations and what's already in place in the kind of um, situation across their local area, which they may have some insight into, but may not be the whole picture. Um, and um, in terms of kind of that, that, that offer on uh, homelessness work for, for new organisations, I'd encourage them to think, um, obviously rough sleeping is a very visible form of homelessness and, and um, requires an immediate humanitarian response. But I think there's um, massive value in the work that, that churches and faith organisations do to prevent homelessness, to keep people connected, uh, into communities to, to give them a place to be um, and um, sort of in, you know, on, ongoing opportunity in their lives to, to, to play an active role in, in society. So there's a lot more, I think, than just that kind of rough sleeping relief space for, for churches and faith organisations to be active within that they're already doing. Yeah, and I think, as you were saying, it's this sort of partnership concept, isn't it? And It'd be wonderful if every locality had a had a sort of a partnership that was looking at all of these things. Um, how how would we sustain that? Do you think? Um, so, I mean, locality partnerships are now you know, becoming fairly standard. It's within government policy that every local authority area should have <coughs> a, a, a cross sector partnership um, to uh, approach the challenges of uh, ending rough sleeping and, and reducing homelessness. Um, I think as with any partnership, it's always um, important that it's formed on kind of solid principles of, of why it is that you're working together um, and, and the additional value that you're seeking to create through that partnership, um, what it is that, that you will um, be able to do better by working together and, and actually taking the time to express what that is and hold that kind of front and centre when inevitably you know things get tough or people disagree or, or there's challenging decisions to be made um relationships obviously play a, a, a critical part in any partnership as well so you know taking the time to build good relationships and um, understand kind of where people are at and where they're coming from uh, the challenges that they might be facing from their organizational perspective or political perspective as well if you're working with councils so um Things that are common, I think, across working in, in partnership and in, in, in any part of life uh, will apply uh, in this space as well. Well, that's great. Thanks so much for joining us, Molly, and all the best to you and Greater Manchester. Thank you. Cheers, Ian. So moving across to Wolverhampton from Manchester and Paul Watson, how have you found it working with local authorities with Enterprise Homes? So first of all, thank you for the opportunity to, to share our experience this morning. So Enterprise Homes Group was born um, from a, a perspective of, of need. Um, Matt, my CEO, who spoke this morning, uh, shared um, the reason, you know, the, the, the process around um, the Good Samaritan story and how we wanted to change that narrative slightly. Uh, and, and so um, it was born out of need, but we found as we began to, to, to serve um, the, the city of Wolverhampton, that the needs changed constantly. And so when the COVID pandemic hit at every locality, um, we were invited uh, as, as part of uh, the, the voluntary sector organizations to, to support that work. And we found that a real, really good opportunity. And that opportunity afforded us the opportunity to, to, to collaborate, to be part of to be partnership, um, have a partnership methodology, and just to really be get into the, um, to demonstrate and be visible leaders. The role that we played in, in that process was effectively concierge um, within the Everyone in um, program, emergency program. So our role was to connect with services, whether they be professional or voluntary, and just connect the, the, the guys and the girls who had you know been um, removed from the streets and to support them so we were able to demonstrate that in a number of ways first and foremost we were just there as a glue just to connect different people so services that would be professional services 
emergency services, we were able to provide that clarity of, you know, we're here to serve. So that was the first thing that was noticed. The second thing is we, um, we took the approach that if there's no one else there, we'll be there. So there were many times when there was no one else available to talk to these, these um, the cohorts which we, that we were serving, we were there. And it became very clear that that was a key role to move forward. So it wasn't just about bringing people in, it actually was journeying with, with the people that we were serving. That became very evident. And actually the theme um, and, and the term that was used um, about the services that we were able to provide with our um, frontline uh, support team, we, we, we were the glue that held everything together. Now, that's not something we, we uh, created. That was something that was presented to us as, as a way that we were serving. That afforded us an opportunity to continue to work in a collaborative way and to build partnerships, to get to know services and groups that we hadn't previously worked with. But the amazing thing that came out of this is the theme of City of Wolverhampton Council is out of darkness cometh light. And I thought that was really interesting because it, as we began to serve and show and demonstrate light in this season, it, 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 was, it was as if the, the City of Wolverhampton Council were aligning with that. Now, again, that wasn't about us, but we believe it was a clear indication from God that we were meant to do this. So the approach of the organization started to adapt based on that. And we just got closer and closer and closer. And so our approach was like, where can we serve? And we continue to do that. That's great. That's great, Paul. And I love that concept of being the glue. Um, and also this, que this question about making connections. So we're gonna move now to uh, Southampton um, and to Bedford and London, uh, we bring Paul and Simon in just to talk to us a little bit about making connections in our place. Thanks very much, Ian. Uh, it's already a very inspiring morning, so I'm glad that so many people have joined us. And uh, thanks for a moment just to share a little bit about Southampton. I think going back a few years, um, the issue of homelessness was still there, but there was generally just a lot of distrust between different groups, between the council and the church, and between the church and uh, businesses and so it went on and so in the end we we called everyone together for a conference a citywide conference and that's one way that we made uh, connections and we disciplined ourselves to only listen so if, if someone said something that we didn't like or didn't agree with rather than getting straight into the argument we would uh, be disciplined about listening and so we did a two-day conference and the rule on the first day was you had to listen to what everyone had to say so we had the different political parties speak, business people speak, churches and other, other groups uh, just explaining their work. And I think from that listening, it built up a real sense of trust. And then we focused ourselves on a few, four or five uh, projects that we could work on. Uh, we realised that we really didn't know what was going on in our own city, even those people that really thought they did know what was going on. And so we committed to sharing that information on a website, which we launched three months later with Street Support with an app. And I think that encouraged people that we hadn't just had a talking shop uh, with lots of people in the room, but we'd listened to each other, we'd worked out some key problems and then together, uh, drawing together people's uh, budgets. So that power in partnership thing is very true, isn't it, Kathy? That actually when you've got people in the room who can make a decision and fund stuff, there's nothing that's not, not impossible, nothing that's not possible for that group. And then we also committed to writing a charter. So to have a common vision that we could all come and come together under and some values and not necessarily that we'd all support each other's work because we don't agree with everything everyone's done but that we wouldn't actively work against one another which was happening before that and so then everyone went back to their boards and their groups and their trustees decided whether they would sign this charter or not and then in September so just eight months later um, we had 35 different organizations including the local authority and police and so on all agreed to this charter and it's really been the bedrock then for a lot of work that's built on listening, built on trust and built on real problems uh, that we could work on and tackle together. So that's our experience. I think it's very difficult for a local authority sometimes to try and pull everyone in the room without there being a power imbalance. And probably the advantage of us as church pulling everyone together is we were almost neutral brokers. So not, not glue, but we were brokering the relationships between businesses and and the council and police and coming at it in a very open-handed way and I think that that helped us and also it was our budget at risk rather than the council's budget at risk and their heads on the line rather than the council lead so I think 
that helped everyone. Um, I'll finish and hand on to Simon. But when we were planning this, one of the high up people in the council said, yeah, oh, this is an interesting idea. Pull everyone in together in a room and then see what we decide together. She said, there's actually a lot of evidence that collaboration works. I said, right, <laughs> imagine that. So um, just the idea that collaboration works can be a new idea to some people, I think. And, uh, but we found it to be true in Southampton. So thanks for your time uh, to speak today. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, really lovely to be with you all. Yeah, so I, I'm Simon. I work for the MHCLG now uh, as a as an advisor to to the government on on faith and community issues. Uh, but previously to this role, I, I could have been sat on the other side of it. I, I ran a homeless and refugee charity in Bedford, which is uh, for ten years, which is where I am still sat in my uh, garage slash office, as many of us have been stuck at home. But it's good to be here. But as I was reflecting on this, I think Paul's covered some you know, some really great things there. But I tend to like to think about this um, area in, in three in three parts, really. And the first is uh, the importance of like, firstly, you've got to be connected. You've got to uh, identify those local forums, reach out to local authorities and other partners doing similar things. So firstly, just to get connected in, find out what's happening and, and, and send an email, get connected. The, the second thing would be about communicating. Uh, so it's really important that we identify problems. I think that's fine, but I think we also want to be people of solutions. So it, I think oh, we always used to have a rule in my charity. If we if we identify a problem, we've also got to bring a solution to that problem at the same time. And so so being a people that's known for bringing solutions, I think is is really important. So identifying a problem, but but bringing that solution. So communicating uh, with people so it's connecting communication and then the third thing I like to think about is having that clarity of purpose so so like Kathy was touching on earlier it's what are we prepared to do and what are we not prepared to do and 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 also you know and, and listening to other people where can we fit why are we doing what we're doing we don't want to just open another soup run if there's already 30 soup runs happening you know, it's having that real clarity of purpose focus on the people that we're actually trying to help and, and, and just knowing what we're prepared to do and what we're not prepared to do. So I think of it in, in those three terms, so really being connected, uh, communicating you know, effectively and having real clarity of purpose. So they're my kind of three thoughts on it. Well, wow, that's so much wisdom from, from, you, from you two. And uh, we're going to be taking that in, I'm sure, into all of our partnerships in, in terms of making even more connections within our place. The thing that I suppose that we do bring as a, as a group, though, is the is the um, importance of prayer. Uh, and so we're going to just move across now to Bath um, and to Salford and just talk about how we can pray into the challenges with uh, Peter and with David. Hi, hello, uh, Ian. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, we're talking about praying and praying for people uh, who are homeless um, and um, um, I'm part of the Genesis Trust in Bath, and we bring lots of volunteers together from all our churches in order to help people who are disadvantaged and who are homeless in different ways. And a lot of that obviously is about praying for, for people. Um, the starting point is obviously that we pray for people as much as we can, uh, but it's not always possible one-to-one uh, -to, -one to do it. Um, but prayer is part of a journey for our clients. And we very much see every one of our clients as being on a journey and it's their journey, not ours. And we're alongside them and prayer is part of that. Uh, we, we don't impose it on people, um, but obviously the more that you know somebody, uh, the more focused our, our prayers can be for them. And then the next time you meet them, you can ask them how they're getting on, uh, ask for an update and so on. So we're in the business of one-to-one -one journeys and, and prayer is part of it. If we think about that from the point of view of the person being prayed for, uh, the person doing the praying or the volunteer or staff member and the place, uh, that, that might be helpful. So from the person being prayed for, I mean, we all know most people do appreciate prayer. Uh, even if they don't believe in prayer, um, they like, they love being cared for as a person and the prayer demonstrates that. People, especially people who are homeless, have so much experience of being ignored and invisible and categorized as, you know, over there somewhere. And actually just to pick up with people and treat them as, as real individuals on a journey and making prayer part of it is really important. 
from the point of view of our volunteers and our staff members, then obviously, you know, we have the normal guidelines, need to be respectful, sensitive, choose the right moment. Um, if someone's on a drugs high, there's very well no point at all in praying with them. You can pray from a distance, but not with them. Um, ask people first, don't touch them without permission. Don't have a man and a woman on their own praying because of safeguarding and so on. But more importantly, really, is the place and is the culture where, where prayer happens, where you have volunteers and people who are homeless or disadvantaged um, together. So a key thing is the setting, uh, just to, to have a, a culture where, where prayer is and becomes natural and, and normal. Um, so here just quickly are, are four different settings that we've had experience of and to see what we can learn from them. And um, the first one uh, is a one day a week um, setting where we're providing food and we're cooking and serving. And what we find is that some volunteers are actually reluctant to, to sit and to talk and to pray. They like doing the cooking, they like doing the serving. Um, and, and the customers really don't expect in the culture of the place to, to, be, to be prayed for. Uh, we always pray together before we open the doors, we pray in our team meetings. So it's a place of, of food and friendship, but not a place of prayer in terms of the culture. And that's a bit of a missed opportunity. Um, and that, that project no, is, no longer, is no longer happening. But there's a, a new one which came up during the pandemic, which is very different. Um, it's in a different place. Um, and um, we said before we started it, there's no point in us providing food just as another cafe and food club if it's not actually full of prayer, because otherwise we might just as well be like any other organization. So it is a place of prayer and food. And it started like this from day one, um, and which was just a year ago. Um, and so our volunteers, they volunteer to serve and pray. So we have some people who are cooking, who are volunteering to cooking, others are volunteering, serving and praying. And that's the job description. We have a big prayer box at the end of the hall where people can post their prayers if they don't want to say them to people. And nearly everybody is prayed for. They're just sitting at the table. It's not in a back room hidden away somewhere. Everyone else is eating all around. It's fine for people to be praying. And it's a really Holy Spirit filled atmosphere. Uh, the third example is of a drop in, which we've run for years, which uh, is open every day of the week. And that's sort of halfway between the first two that I've talked about. It was a drop in before the pandemic. It's now much more one-to-one uh, -one and, and courses, socially distanced and so on. But it really helps people to move forward in their journey uh, more than the first two projects because there's so much one-to-one -one stuff that happens there. Prayer is expected as part of it. It doesn't happen all the time, but it is much more natural there. And we have many courses that go on that include prayer or talking about prayer as part of what happens. And prayer becomes part of the journey of the individual. Uh, and then my, uh, my fourth example, street pastors, which I expect many of us are familiar with, where uh, we pray for people in, in doorways, or maybe keeping down for the night. Uh, people can be very philosophical in that situation, so we can have great long chats with people. They've got lots of time to think about stuff. Uh, and usually one person kneels down and, and may or may not pray, depending on, on, on the individual that's there. And others will pray for them at a distance, uh, but we don't impose on people, obviously. So you've got four different settings there. Um, but uh, overall sort of conclusion to it is we don't just pray for people to overcome their problems. We help people to overcome their problems. And that is really important. And so if we say, ask ourselves the question, why do we pray for people? Well, it's to bless them, but also to show them. So to bless them, to ask God to be part of the future and a future that's going to go in a good direction for them, that they can be who they're made to be and to encourage them that God exists, that Jesus loves them in their walk of faith, but then also to show them, because it shows them that we care about them as individuals, that we're here because we are following Jesus, that we show them that we're walking alongside them and encouraging and helping and praying them and, and showing them that they can follow Jesus too, and to make that part of their journey. So that, that's fine. I think, Dave, over to you, and uh, do you want to pick up from that? We'll pick up for that. Thanks, Peter. I just want to pick up very, very quickly on two things. One, we're talking about here of praying into challenges. For us, we need to be in the right place. We need to look after ourselves in prayer. We, we a lot of us are involved in, in challenging work, in helping people with challenging situations. So, first point is, we'll, we'll reflect on this in our session later. 
how how do we actually keep ourselves in that place with God? There's a verse in the Bible that says this, be still and know that I'm God. I don't know about you, but my life can be 100 miles an hour at times. And I just need one at some points just to be still, just to be in his presence, just to receive from him, just to be strengthened by him, just to be blessed by him. Secondly, praying strategically and coordinatedly for, to see major change in housing and homelessness in your city or your town or your borough rather than just reactionary prayers to what's happening that day and we need them as well but we how do we how do we have a vision for how how housing is going to be more affordable more of the housing more available with the support around it how do we pray into that and what is our long to medium and long-term vision and prayer strategy to see things really change in our nation where everyone has that place they can call home and has that right to that place they can call home. We'll look at that a bit in a bit more detail later on. I'll hand back to Ian. Thank you, Ian. Oh, that's great. Thanks so much, Peter and David, for giving us those thoughts. Um, really important for us to have that in the, in the centre of what we do. Um, we're going to go finally to Leeds and we're going to have Dave and Mary help us with how to bring lived experience into future design, the importance of agency, choice and empowerment for those that we work with. So Dave and Mary, welcome to you. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, so Dave and I um, are uh, part of a charity called Unity and Poverty Action um, and we coordinate Leeds Homeless Charter. Um, so we aim to bring different sectors of the city together to tackle issues of homelessness and housing. Um, and part of that is running um, various different action groups on different subjects. Um, so we've got Shakir with us, I believe, who has been um, part of our migration and homelessness action group um, and has been sharing uh, his experiences uh, as an asylum seeker who's faced homelessness um, and destitution. So we're going to hear from him in a bit, but I'm just going to give a little bit of context um, to what we're what we're doing and why why we're doing this why we feel that um hearing from lived experience um is is important um we try to hear about um people's part what what's gone on in people's past so what people have been through barriers that they've faced um and what's helped them uh, but also people who are facing current situations so uh looking at what people think would would help them to get out of the situation they're in and could potentially help others. Um, I think we found this process incredibly helpful. Uh, in our meetings, we try to to make this the focus, to hear from people first and then kind of structure the rest of the meeting around what what people have, have told us. Um, but I think we also recognise that we're really just at the beginning of process of understanding how to do this well. Um, and it tends to often raise more questions and answers about how we're doing this, um, not just hearing from people's experiences. Um, but uh, resourcing them to not to be part of the solution, but to to be the solution and to kind of design the services um, that that are needed. Um, so a few reasons why we think this is so important. Um, we think it's really important that the people with power to make decisions to affect people's lives um, don't just see a category or a label like people who are homeless, but who uh, that they have a person in mind uh, when they're um, commissioning and designing services. It's so different when you've you've heard someone's story, you've heard their background, you have a person's face in your mind when you're thinking about um, about an about an issue. Um, one of the things with the pandemic is that um, services have just become so much more remote. Um, so much, many more assessments and things are done online or on the phone. Um, so you're hearing a lot of prob people's problems, but you're not seeing that that person's face. Um, you're often stretched for time and don't always get to understand the background, why why people are where they are. So we feel that giving the opportunity is really important. Um, it's really easy to make assumptions about what the real issue is. And it's not until you actually hear what people have been through that you start to really understand the real um, the real causes, the real root causes of, of what's happening. Um, and there's something about the process um, of being heard that hopefully um, empowers people. I think poverty is very good at, at stripping people of empowerment 
um, and uh, that silences people and this is an opportunity for people to be heard. Um, but also, like I said, to become, to be the solution, like we've seen so many times that um, in communities, there are solutions there. And things like peer mentoring, community uh, cooperatives, um, credit unions, that sort of thing. The solution is often in the community. And as we've already said, there's a tendency to want to be the good Samaritan um, who comes to fix an issue, but sometimes it's about stepping back and saying, how, how can we be uh, somebody who resources this community themselves to find um, the answer to, to the needs that are within? So, yep, I'll just hand over to Dave. Yeah, thank you, Mary. I hope you can hear me okay, everyone. Can we just have Shakia um, uh, Kay on the main uh, platform, if that's okay? Shakia's just going to come and do a, a very short interview. Hi, Shakia. Good to see you. Um, Shakia, can you just unmute yourself? And yeah, I do. Can you just I do. Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, Shakia. Yeah. Can you just briefly tell us um, some of your experiences of being homeless? We thought it'd be good to share, rather than just talk about lived experience, let's just hear from someone with lived experience. Um, so yeah, Shakir, just briefly, just tell us how, what's been your experience of being homeless? Yeah, I wa first of all, I wanna say hello to everyone. And I wanna say, I wanna share my story uh, uh, in short. And uh, because it's so long, if I start, it's not finished, one hour is not enough. Uh, uh, I want to say homelessness and living this bridge, it is hard for first for British local people who they have support, assistance and benefits and uh, they have a, a lot of things but what about asylum seekers who they don't have nothing nothing of this and this and street is not welcome for everybody just find a tent somewhere or go put tent everywhere is not allowed in this country but we made it we made it and we face a lot of challenges because we forced to live in this environment and uh, you're always struggling where i am living when i'm going to sleep tonight where i am going to eat because you have no income and no support from home office we hear in the social media people say asylum seekers and they still they use it for political things they have they give them ice cream and uh, hotel rooms and 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 massage and this is rubbish things and because they 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 use it for they use it for political things i slept in the past in under the bridge and everywhere car parks uh, uh, around the canals, everywhere, everywhere. And they were struggling even just for food. And in this situation, you will not have a conclusion. Is only two things you will take with you from this. A mental health first and second damage in your body physically. Sh Shakir, if you can, yeah. can you just share very briefly about what happened to you when you... Um... When you, when the when the coronavirus broke out in the UK, what what happened there when you were staying at the night shelter? Yeah, when I uh, it's when I the first time with the first uh, time I uh, went uh, to from church to church. Then I when it starts that uh, that uh, that COVID, and uh, it starts more hard for us because uh, all the places we was go. To have like uh, like socialize, meet friends, meet it, it was just a hope for us. Is all of them they are close and and uh, this uh, restriction it's make it worse for us because you stay all day because now I have accommodation uh, 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 with help from uh, uh, it's called Lidas, isn't it? Lidas, yeah, and uh, all the facilities. And where I was spend all my day just in my room. I go sometimes only outside. It gets more and more mental health, very, very hard. And you had to leave the night shelter because you caught coronavirus, didn't you? You had to leave the night shelter, is that yeah, right? Yeah, yes. And yes, you went to the true. hotel to self-isolate. Yeah, I yeah, I was uh, two two places. Uh, one uh, in a hotel in Chapel Allerton. Uh, 
with separate room, but uh, this, the next one, I was moved to other one because I think the law, you're not, you can stay longer in one hotel. I went to other places, but that other place, it's, uh, it is very rough because it was most of the people, they was sick mental health and they use in spice. Even you can't, you can't, you can't go outside because even, even you close the door and the window, the spice come into your, your head and your, your nose and your head. And yes. I was, I was very, very damaged in that hotel. Right, right. And you've got accommodation now, just very briefly, and apologies for everyone that we've gone yeah. slightly over. I think we've done nine minutes instead of seven. But just Shakir, just how do you find it coming to meetings and, and sharing your, your perspective and, and input and into, into char homeless charter meetings? Do you find that good or, or does it, is, is it yeah. difficult sometimes? Yeah, it's, it's, a it's very positive because I'm very positive because when you find somebody, they heard your voice and they, and they, and they send they heard what you say and they send that message to the other high level or other people. It is you become very positive. At least you have somebody they listen to you. Yeah. They hear your voice. If not, that means it's it's gets it gets more more yeah more pressure more a lot of things. It's yeah. No, that's that's a really good. And we've done we've done Zoom calls literally out in the park with me on the phone, haven't we? Before, so that's been a yeah. Good. Shakir, thank you so much for sharing, Mary. Yeah, you're very quick, welcome. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Any very quick much. thoughts to, to share, Mary? Because we, we're over time. But anything you want to share, and then we'll yeah. hand back to Ian. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shakir. Yeah, yeah, thank Shakir. You. Um, in our last meeting, um, that theme of the long term effects of trauma and of um, homelessness and isolation and that trauma was something that really came out and really good to be able to feed that back to people um, just to say that in our breakout room was look at a little bit more some of the questions like how do you value the person as well as their experiences how do you look after people's well-being when they're they're sharing stories um, and yeah overcoming some of the barriers to people sharing that honest dialogue so if anyone wants to join us for the breakout room We'll be at oh, that's great, Mary and Dave. Thank you so thank much you. for that. But Shakia, thank you so much for telling your story to us today. We're uh, honoured to have heard that, and we just pray for you as you continue your journey.